Good morning to all. Come on in and have a seat, and we're going to begin our service this morning. Welcome. We're so glad you're here for uh, the first Sunday in December. It's next month already, and uh, it's the month of, of December when we celebrate Christmas and uh, enjoy all the great uh, times that we have together. It's great for us to be able to worship together. And let me share with you a scripture from uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. But it's a scripture that you know. Listen to this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that was the prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus would be born. That was the prophecy of, of the birth of Christ and of the season of which we are in now that we're celebrating. So it is wonderful for us to be together, wonderful for us to uh, worship God. Let me share with you just a few prayer needs. Uh, there is a, a list, a paper on the table in the foyer that you can uh, look at this, but... Uh, the first on the list is uh, Tom McFadden. Good to see Tom visiting here today. Oh. <laughs> oh, hey. Tom. Tom, Tom is visiting because for the last few weeks he's been in the hospital and, and been ill. But uh, good to see you, Tom. I, I thought I saw Santa Claus back there, but it was Tom. God bless you. Glad you're here. And we need to continue to pray for Tom. We need to pray for all these on our list. I know uh, one of the last ones on the list is Dan and Chris Owsley, who are camp managers up in Salem, Indiana, at a church, Christian church camp. And uh, uh, Chris uh, Owsley, Dan's wife, Chris actually has uh, cancer, uh, lymphoma cancer, and uh, the doctor has decided to send her home for the month of December, let her rest and gain strength, and then come back for some more treatments to the hospital here in, uh, in Louisville. So uh, keep the Owsleys in your prayers. Keep all these folks in your prayers. And let me just mention, in this time of year, during this season of year, uh, we, we have a lot of stresses. And I want to just ask you to, uh, to know that and just... Uh, we are praying for each other. We're praying that uh, God will bless. We're praying that you'll be able to withstand the stressors that you'll be facing. And I know that many of us have personal prayer needs, and uh, we want to lift all of this up to the Lord right now. Would you bow with me as we begin our service with prayer? Thank you, Father, for meeting our needs. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for the Christmas season that we can uh, remember the birth of Christ, that you sent your son, uh, not just to be a baby in a, man a manger, but to live a perfect life and then to give that life in sacrifice for our souls and to resurrect on the third day to live forevermore as your uh, child, but our Savior. Thank you, Father, for watching and blessing and ministering to us. We thank you for uh, those who are recovering from illnesses. We ask that uh, you would uh, keep them in your care, Father, that we continue to pray for them. We pray for our uh, others on our prayer list, that uh, they'll be gaining strength, that they'll be finding good reports from the doctors, that uh, health continues for them. Father, we pray for our own personal needs. I know several here in our uh, assembled congregation this morning who are facing stress and some personal health issues. Father, we lift these up to you and we ask that you would bless us as only you can. Bless us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we now pray. Amen. In the uh, J.B. Phillips translation of the New Testament, John 1.14 says, So the Word of God became a human being and lived among us. We saw his splendor, the splendor as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. We are now in the month of December, and our minds turn to things of Christmas, at least mine do, mine does. And someone once said that Christmas is the time when God came alive. And by that, they mean that God incarnate, Jesus Christ came to earth. To become incarnate is to embody flesh and bones, to be a human, to be, well, Jesus is God in the flesh. 
And at Christmas, God's word was vindicated because throughout the Old Testament, God promised to send the Messiah. God's word was vindicated. And God's character was illustrated. Mankind knew little of God's character before the incarnation. The only perfect revelation God ever made of himself was made through Jesus Christ. And when God sent his son to earth, his love was demonstrated. You know, the value of a gift is measured by the heart of the giver. And you're very well familiar with John 3:16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And in the coming of Jesus to earth, God's purpose was consummated. God's purpose since the inception of time was to redeem his lost creation. Through Je though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the place of redemption is Calvary. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So this morning we partake of the Lord's Supper even in December, even at Christmas time, because Jesus came to earth to live a perfect righteous life and then to die for our sins and to be resurrected on the third day. He left us this memorial, the Lord's Supper, so that we would remember his death on Calvary for us, for our sins. Not his birth, his death. Therefore, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, as we celebrate this Christmas, don't forget the old slogan, the reason for the season. Jesus Christ. Let's pray and then we'll partake of the bread and the juice. Thank you, Father, for your son Jesus, our Savior, that you sent to die for us after having lived a perfect life and to be resurrected from the dead, never to die, and to ascend unto heaven to be at your right hand, prepared to come back and take us to be forever with him, with our Father, and live eternally. And now, Father, I pray that you would bless this communion service, that we'll remember the reason for the season is Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Great. Merry Christmas. It looks beautiful around here, doesn't it? Amen. Yeah, thank you so much to everyone who uh, contributed to decorate... Uh, the church for Christmas uh, looks wonderful. Uh, let me pray for us as we get started. Uh, God, thank you so much for this morning, and thank you for uh, all the many blessings that you give us. Thank you so much for Christmas time and um, the um, the season that we have to celebrate uh, joy and and love and um, the the care and compassion that you have for us that you would come down into this world to be with us, that you would uh, enter your creation to redeem us. Uh, you would uh, die on the cross to forgive us of our sins. And we thank you so much for this, this opportunity we have during this season to celebrate that, to celebrate how you overcame death to provide us a way to have life. We love you and we thank you. To your name I pray. Amen. Uh, by a show of hands, uh, how many of you uh, put up your Christmas tree over Thanksgiving weekend? How many people did that? That's kind of a, a tradition for a lot of people, I think. How many of you uh, put up your Christmas decorations uh, way before that? Anybody? Anybody? Oh my goodness, y'all are nuts. <laughs> uh, how many of you um, are real Christmas tree people? You have to have a real Christmas tree, Okay. Not anymore? All right. Uh, how many of you just are like, I just want to go with the, the store-bought um, uh, fake tree? That's me. Yeah, that's what y'all are my people. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's making that clicking noise. Um, 
<clears throat> my wife will tell you, uh, I'm a little bit of a Grinch uh, when it comes to putting up the Christmas tree, putting up Christmas decorations. I hate it. I absolutely hate putting up Christmas. I love when it's up. I, I love it. It's beautiful. I love, I love seeing it, but I don't want to do any of the work <laughs> to put it up. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I, I know a lot of people are, are very uh, uh, adamant one way or another, passionate one way or another. They're, they absolutely love uh, Christmas decorations, and then other people are just like, oh, it's just a hassle. Well, I'm on, I'm on the hassle end of the spectrum. Uh, so I love when they're up, but I don't want to do any of the work. But anyway, um, <clears throat> trees, uh, trees are very prominent in Scripture, in the Bible. Trees play a prominent role, uh, both in a literal sense. Uh, people sit on trees. Zacchaeus climbed a tree. Uh, trees serve as landmarks to describe where things are located. For instance, burial sites are often by trees. But they also play a prominent role metaphorically in the Bible. Uh, one example is Psalm chapter 1, uh, where it says that if you obey the law of the Lord, you'll be like a tree planted by streams of water. You will grow tall and strong. You will have deep roots. You'll produce good fruit, and your, your leaves will always be green. Whatever you do will prosper. Uh, the healthy tree is a picture of our lives when we live according to God's Word. Jeremiah said something similar. Uh, he said, anyone who trusts the Lord will be like a tree planted by water with deep roots. In the midst of storms or drought or intense heat, the tree still stands and does not wither. The, the tree is a picture of strength and resiliency. And so trusting in the Lord gives us strength and resiliency in the midst of trials in our life. Uh, one time, uh, Jesus was passing by a fig tree. It was early spring. The Bible tells us that the trees were in leaf, uh, meaning that they had just started to bloom, uh, but there were, no tree, there were no fruit yet on the trees. Uh, this particular fig tree that Jesus passed by, however, had fully developed leaves. It was an early bloomer. Uh, it should have started to grow early figs by this point, but when Jesus went over to pick a piece of fruit, there were none to be found. And then Jesus cursed this tree, and it immediately withered all the way down to the root. This tree was a, a picture, uh, an image of what happens when we look the part on the outside, but we aren't authentic on the inside. We look good from far away, but we look like we have it all together, but in reality, we aren't really walking with the Lord. We aren't really living out our faith. And so all throughout the Bible, trees are used metaphorically, figuratively to describe life. Because in fact, trees give life. Trees are life-giving. They provide us oxygen. They, they provide us fruit to eat. The wood of trees provides us with shelter to build houses to protect us from the, the elements. Uh, we can build a fire to keep us warm or to cook our food with the wood. Trees give and sustain life. And in the book of Genesis, there are two trees. One called the tree of life. You could call it the, the tree that brings life. The second is called the tree of knowledge. But you can, you can just as easily call it the tree that brings death. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 2. That's the story we'll be looking at this morning. The words will also be on the screen behind me if you want to follow along there. Genesis chapter 2. Uh, this morning we're kicking off our, our series leading up to Christmas called, O oh Christmas Tree. Uh, you're all probably familiar with the, the Christmas carol, the uh, the traditional song about the beauty and the splendor of the evergreen tree that we decorate at Christmas time. A tradition tells us that in the 700s, uh, there was a monk named Boniface uh, who went out in the forest and he chopped down an oak tree to show that trees were, were not to be worshipped, but the one who created the trees was the one that ought to be worshipped. And so as the story goes, when he chopped down this oak tree, 
it fell and crushed everything around it, except one tiny fir sapling. Uh, convinced that the survival of this little sapling represented God's faithfulness and his protection, Boniface began planting fir saplings every year to celebrate Christmas. Uh, eventually, this led to uh, people uh, bringing evergreen branches into their homes around Christmas, and uh, this eventually evolved into bringing entire trees into the home at Christmas. The Christmas tree today represents the cross. It's a visual reminder of the reason Christ came into the world on Christmas. But long before Christmas trees, long before the cross, there were two trees planted in the midst of the garden. Let's read Genesis 2, 15 through 17. <clears throat> the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. In the garden, God planted trees. Lots and lots of trees. Verse 9 says that he planted every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. But there were two trees that God planted in the midst of the garden that seemingly were far more pleasant than any other. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the garden, Adam and Eve lived between these two trees. God placed Adam in the midst of the garden to care for it and to cultivate it. He allowed Adam to eat the fruit of any tree and to enjoy himself. But he gave him this one seemingly arbitrary stipulation. You must not eat from the, no the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because, God said, that if you eat from it, you will surely die. This, this begs the question, why? Why this one specific stipulation? What about the tree? Or what about the fruit? Made it bad to eat. Was it, was it poisonous? Was it rotten? Did the fruit actually transfer knowledge of good and evil? Like when you ate the fruit, did you all of a sudden have your mind open and all of a sudden you know things you didn't know before? What about the fruit caused you to die? Did it cause you to die immediately? Did it cause you to die later on? Did it cause you to get sick and then you would die? What about this fruit? What about this tree was so bad that they could not eat of it? Why was this one seemingly mere indiscretion the thing that got them kicked out of the garden altogether? At Romans 5, 12 through 15, Paul addresses this very question. He explains the effects uh, that this one indiscretion had. Romans 5, 12 through 15. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. This was not simply a mere indiscretion. This was disobedience to a command of God. Whether the command makes sense to us or not, disobeying it is a sin. But it is the consequences of the sin that, that make the act so damaging. It, it may seem like it's no big deal. I mean, it, it's just a piece of fruit. It's just one bite. What could... But what happened after that one bite 
makes it a really big deal. The consequences of this one act was that sin entered the world. This one man's act brought sin into the world. Sin was not in the world before this. But because they chose to eat of the, of the fruit, sin entered the world. And not just sin. Death followed right behind. And death didn't just enter the world, Paul said. Death reigned over the world. Because of this one act. Because of this one act, death ruled over the world and everyone who came into the world after that. The Bible speaks of three different types of death. And they all entered into the world the moment Adam sinned. They all have been reigning over the world ever since. Now, the first is physical death. Well, we experience the effects of physical death every single day. When your joints ache in the morning, you wake up. When you have the flu or a cold, cancer, heart disease, COPD, coronavirus. Our prayer list is full of medical needs because of the effects of physical death reigning over this world. As morbid as it may sound, and as, as much as we don't like to think about it or talk about it, every single day we are all one day closer to our physical death. Like a, a shadow that is constantly cast over us. Physical death reigns. If you watch the news enough, you, you'd be convinced that you're continually on the verge of death, right? Right? The, because the oceans are polluted, we consume tiny particles of plastic every single time we eat or drink. There's insecticides on all of our vegetables. Too many carbs will kill you. High fructose corn syrup will kill you. Who knows what's in hot dogs? Those will definitely kill you, right? If you go outside, you can get diseases from mosquitoes and ticks. But if you use bug spray to try to ward them off, that can give you cancer as well. You can get skin cancer from the sun, but the sunscreen that protects you from the sun also causes cancer. You can die in a car wreck driving to work, but if you choose to walk instead, that isn't any safer. Over a million people, uh, pedestrians, are killed every single, day, or every single year. You can die that way too. We live in the shadow of death. We see its effects every second of the day. But physical death is just one type of death mentioned in the Bible. The second is spiritual death. Col Colossians 2.13 says that you who are a Christian, you were dead in your trespasses. Being dead in your trespasses or dead in your sin is being spiritually dead. Now, this refers uh, to someone who's a, a non-Christian, someone who hasn't, who hasn't given their life to Christ. Their spirit is dead. They're spiritually separated from God. They cannot interact with Him. They cannot hear from Him. They cannot speak to Him. They are spiritually, deficient, de spiritually deficient. Uh, also, we, we also see the effects of spiritual death every single day. Uh, people who are spiritually dead are, are not guided by the Spirit. Their moral compass is skewed. At uh, Romans 1, Paul says that sin dampens our moral conscience. And without the aid of the Spirit, people who are spiritually dead become more and more corrupt. We live in a morally corrupt society because of people who are spiritually dead. Uh, according to the CDC... A third of the population of the United States, it's 100, over 100 million people, currently have an STD. They are, they are teaching sex education in kindergarten. They're having men dressed in drag reading, kid, reading to kids at library. More than half of all babies in this country are born out of, wet, out of wedlock. A third of children grow up without a father. 
About 60 million babies have legally been murdered since Roe v. Wade in 1973. There, there are thousands of charities in the United States that are set up largely as money-making schemes. Where less than 50% of the donations given actually go to the cause. Uh, the Tampa Bay Times recently compiled a list of the 50 worst charities. These 50 charities collect hundreds of billions of dollars and less than 4% of that money goes to the actual cause. Six of those charities, 0% of the money goes to any cause at all. Executives of those charities take multiple salaries, they pay themselves consulting fees, they pay out contracts to friends and to other businesses they own themselves or that their friends own. Greed, corruption, sexual immorality, the breakdown of the family, the devaluing of human life are all a result of living under the shadow of spiritual death. But there's a third type of death that began to reign over this world with this one single act. Eternal death. This is the fate of all people who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. Condemnation to hell, where there will be pain and suffering, wailing and gnashing of teeth, the lake of eternal fire. And we feel the effects of eternal death every single day. Emotional pain from broken relationships, suffering from loneliness, anxiety about the future, depression from painful memories of the past, grief from a loss, sadness because of disappointments, anger over injustice, feelings of emptiness, hopelessness, and despair, regrets over missed opportunities, longing for something more, boredom, angst, and tedium in the monotony of life. These are all reasons people suffer in this life. And these are all the effects of living under the shadow of eternal death. Because one man sinned, death entered the world. Physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death have been reigning and ruling over this world ever since. And we all live under the shadow of that tree the tree that brought death because one man decided to eat its fruit. Now let's go back and, and read the story of exactly what happened in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6. Genesis 3, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? As Revelation tells us, the snake was Satan. And he asked the woman a leading question. And in so doing, he, he questioned God. He questioned God's motives. And he made Eve doubt her faith. Did God, this God who claims to love you, he claims to care about you, he claims to be good, did he actually say that you could not eat anything that is good? He created all these wonderful trees with all this wonderful fruit, and you can't eat any of it? How can he be good if he doesn't give you anything good? Verse 2, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. No, replied Eve, this isn't what he said. God does love me. He is good. He, he gave all this to me for my good pleasure. But, you know, now, now that you mention it, he did say that we can't eat from this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan got Eve's gears turning. She began questioning God herself. Why would he not want us to eat of this fruit? This seems like an arbitrary rule. It seems overbearing. It seems dictatorial. I mean, he even said we can't even touch it. He didn't say that. Satan twisted God's words, and then Eve followed suit. God did not say they could not touch it. 
And people have been twisting and misconstruing God's word ever since. This was Satan's reply, verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan was claiming that this fruit expanded, will expand their minds so that they would be like God. This was an outright lie. God said, you will surely die. Satan claimed that that was not true. Satan contradicted God, saying that you won't die. God told Adam and Eve that he made them in his image. Once again, Satan claimed that what God said was not true. It is this fruit that will make you like God. And people have been making the same claim ever since. That something other than the image of God you were created with will make you like God. Money, power, prestige, fame, all of these things, attaining these things will give you God-like status. The entry of sin into the world brought death. But it also brought lies and deceit, empty promises, and trivial pursuits. Our eyes desire that which is false and meaningless. That's what happened to Eve. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the, the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. She questioned God's commands. Why would he not want us to have this fruit? What's he hiding? What's he keeping from us? I mean, it's good for food. It's not poisonous. It's not like the fruit from the, the manchineel tree. Uh, this is a picture of the fruit from the manchineel tr uh, tree. This fruit is the most poisonous fruit in the world. So don't go eating it. Uh, it's native to tropical areas uh, from the Florida Keys all the way down to the northern coast of South America. If you're ever in the Florida Keys, don't eat this fruit, okay? Uh, this, this, uh, this fruit's poisonous, but the fruit of the tree of knowledge was not poisonous. It was good for food. Why would God not want me to eat, it, eat of it? It was also a delight to the eyes. It wasn't rotting. It wasn't gross to look at like the, the fingered citron here. Uh, that thing looks like an octopus uh, to me. Uh, there's no way that I would eat that. Uh, it, it, it's fruit that grows on what's called the Buddha's hand citron tree. It's native to northeast India and China. Apparently it tastes like lemons, but I don't want to try that. Uh, but the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge was not ugly. It wasn't rotten. It was a delight to the eyes. It looked good to eat. It was also desired to make one wise. It would not diminish your mental acuity. It's not like the aki fruit that's native to Jamaica. This is a picture of the aki fruit. Uh, if this fruit is eaten before it's ripe, it induces hypoglycemia, uh, which gives you feelings of being uh, drunk, uh, similar to being in a drunken stupor. Uh, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil was not like that. It would make you wise, actually. So why would God not want them to eat of this fruit? It wasn't poisonous. It wasn't rotten. It wasn't going to kill them. In fact, the, the opposite seemed to be true. It looked good. It looked like it would taste good. It even seemed to be a super fruit that would enhance their health. What is God hiding? What's he keeping from us? These are the questions that undoubtedly floated through Eve's mind. But the warning that God gave them about, about this command, the warning that God gives us about sin, is that it leads to death. But we do the same exact thing that Adam and Eve do, or did. It looks good. It sounds good. It seems like it'll actually help me. Why can't I have sex with whoever I want? Why can't I marry whoever I want? Love is love. Why would God want to keep love from me? 
It's just a few dollars here and there. Nobody will ever know. It isn't going to hurt anyone. And in fact, it's, it'll help me, right? It'll, it'll help me pay my bills. It'll help me feed my family. Why would God not want me to do that? We question God's motives when we sin. But sin isn't just a mere indiscretion. When sin enters into the world, so does death. Physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. The consequences of sin are far graver than we can ever imagine. If you eat of the tree, you will surely die. Not because the fruit will kill you, but because sin and death come as a tandem. And when sin entered the world, death began to reign over it. This tree was called the knowledge of good and evil. Not, not because the fruit expanded their minds so as to make them understand things or mentally comprehend good and evil. It wasn't as if the, the fruit gave them the mind of God. That was a lie from Satan. The fruit didn't make them like God. What the fruit did was it gave them first-hand experience of the effects of the existence of good and evil. Apart from sin, there is no good and evil. Everything is just good. There's no concept of evil. But when sin entered the world, evil came along with it. And the consequences of evil are immediately seen. In the very next generation, Cain killed his brother. Evil multiplied evil until the time of Noah. When every inclination of the heart of man was only evil all the time. Evil in the heart of man leads to death. So this tree very easily could be called the tree of death. And we are still living under its shadow to this day. Now that we're all depressed, let's pray. I'm kidding. Luckily, that isn't the end of the story. In the midst of sin and evil and death, Christmas came. Let's go back to Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of, free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Christmas stinks because it reminds us of death. Every year when we gather with friends and family, we see those empty chairs. We're reminded of the ones who are no longer there with us. No longer there to celebrate. We're reminded that death reigns in this world. If death didn't reign over this world, though, Christmas would not have been necessary. We would not have needed God to come into this world. If we didn't live under the shadow of the tree of death, we would have never needed Jesus. And so Christmas reminds us that death does reign. The, the, the Christmas reminds us that death doesn't reign. We don't live under the shadow of death anymore. We live under the shadow of the tree of life. Death is the reason Christmas happened. Death is the reason that Jesus came into this world on Christmas. But that's exactly the reason why Christmas is a time to celebrate. Jesus came into this world to defeat death through the cross and his resurrection three days later. Christmas gives us hope that our physical death is not the end. Christmas gives us peace and comfort because we know that we're no longer spiritually dead. Christmas gives us, our, Christmas strengthens our faith because we know that we will not experience eternal death. For those of us who have been baptized and have been raised to new life, we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. We no longer live under the tree of death. We live under the tree of life. 
Let's pray. God, thank you so much for hope, for peace, for assurance that we have eternal life as our inheritance, that we no longer live under the shade of the tree of life or the tree of death, but we now live under the tree of life. We praise your name because of that. We celebrate this Christmas season because you came into this world and defeated death so that we can have life. God, I pray that, that we as your people would work to continuously snuff out death in this world, that we would continuously bring light into dark places, that we would bring hope where there is none. We would give life where there is only death. God, I pray that this church would be a light in this community, a community full of people who are under the shadow of the tree of death that desperately need you and your, your hope and your salvation. We thank you so much for Christmas and what we have to celebrate. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.